Okay, I believe uh, this is recording. Okay, good. So the first question was to, to prove that the number of jobs waiting or in service for a deterministic queue with the mean arrival late lambda and mean service rate mu. So always lower for MM1 queue uh, with the same parameters. So deterministic, basically you want to show that MD1, uh, sorry, MD1 queue has a lower uh, number of jobs in the system, which is N uh, less than for MM1. So what we need to do is to compute the expected values for both of them. For MM1 system, the, uh, you know, you've already seen this before, the mean number of jobs in the system is given by rho over one minus rho. So that's straightforward. And for the MD1, uh, D is a special, special case of MG1. So D is uh, MG1 with the CS squared, the coefficient of radiation equal to zero. So we can take the MG1 formula, the polacek hinchin formula, and there we compute that expected value of N or N bar, same thing, is given by rho uh, plus rho square uh, one plus CS square over two times one minus rho. And so we substitute CS square equals zero over here. So this becomes uh, rho plus rho square uh, over two times one minus rho. And then we can expand that as uh, two, two rho minus two rho squared plus rho squared, just expanding that over two over one minus rho. And then this can be simplified into, and this is where it gets interesting. You can just simplify into this form, two rho over one minus rho into one minus rho by two. Okay, and uh, this is basically what is going to be two times two rho minus rho square over two one minus rho, and then uh, if you just if you just sort of separate it out, it becomes this value over here, and this part over here is always going to be between uh, zero and one. So because zero is less than equal to rho, less than equal to one, this thing over here, 0 0.5 is less than equal to this value is less than equal to one. Because you're, you know, basically when the, when the rho is smallest possible, this is one, right? Then rho it is zero, this is one minus zero. So that becomes one. And then when rho is uh, one, it's one minus half. So it's half, so it goes between half and one. So this value over here lies in the range zero to one. And so if you compare uh, this value over here, rho or one minus rho, to this value over here, uh, this whole thing over here, you see that you're multiplying rho over one minus rho with some value that's between, that's between 0.5 and one, but it's always less than one, all right? So that shows that basically that proves what we want, which is that the this is the expected number of uh, uh, expected number of uh, jobs in the system with deterministic is always going to be less than with the MM1 key. That's that basically it. So so it's just, it's a little bit of uh, manipulation. Once you have the PK formula, just plug it plug it plugging in value C S square equals zero, and then a little bit of algebraic manipulation to get what you want. Okay, any questions about that? Uh, yeah, so just to clarify, uh, so a deterministic queue refers to MD1Q, not a GD1Q. Uh, yeah, in this case, I, sh I should be more careful. The deterministic rate, I'm saying, yeah, it, uh, you're right. I'm talking about the MD1Q rather than DD1. The DD1 formula is being more complicated. But I'm sorry, that is a misstatement in the question that I should correct. So just make, let me make a note of that just a second uh, to fix it so that next year people will not be confused. But yeah, I did mean the MD, uh, MD1, not the DD1. Sorry. Right, what, I, what I wanted to say was, uh, yeah. Any other questions? That's my mistake. That's all. Okay, so moving on. The second one is uh, sort of similar to this. So the second one, what you're saying over here is, uh, suppose that the service time distribution of a queue with utilization 80% is described as CS square equals three. So we're given rho equals 0.8 and CS square equals 
uh, three, and of course this is an MG1 cube, so that's what we're looking at. We're going to compare the mean time in the system for this cube with that of an MM1 cube with the same mean and arrival and departure rate. So lambda and mu are the same, and we want to compare the MG1 with an MM1. Okay, so we uh, we want to know essentially the expected value of time in the in the in the queue. So we can use the formula that's again that's given to us. So expected time in the queue is given by one over mu, uh, one plus rho one plus c s squared over two times one minus rho. So that's e t. And then when we have uh, m m one, as I mentioned earlier. Cs square equals one. So this is going to be uh, one over uh, mu, uh, one plus, uh, it's going to be, uh, so this is one plus Cs square is going to be two, right? And that cancels out with the two over here. So it's just going to reduce to one plus uh, rho over one minus rho, okay? And uh, and if you simplify that, it just becomes uh, one over mu, one over one minus rho. So that's the that's so that's the expected that's the expected time in the system for mm one. And for this other q, which has a c squared equals three, uh, expected time in the system is going to be uh, given by one over mu, just basically plugging in the values, one plus four rho, so it's a mu, so one plus c squared is four over two times one minus rho. And then this simplifies to one over mu, uh, one plus rho over one minus rho. And if you, if you compare sort of uh, uh, this thing over here with this thing over here, you see that the ratio is going to be, uh, it's just one of one plus rho is the ratio. And uh, uh, basically you're saying that the, the, this Q with the higher coefficient of variation is a ratio of one plus rho longer duration, and this is going to be 1.8. So basically this means that jobs in this system spend 1.8, spend uh, 1.8 times longer in the queue than the corresponding mm1 queue because uh, that's the, so and and so what we're seeing and again the takeaway is that when this c square value goes higher there's higher and higher variability uh, in the in the uh, in the departure process and when that happens uh, remember what's going on intuitively is that in the departure process Whenever we have a low departure rate, you have stuff building up in the queue, right? And whenever you have a high departure rate, but there's nothing in the queue, you're not building up any credit. And so if you have high variability, you tend to build up the queue uh, more than in the MM1 queue. And so what this shows is that your expected time in the system uh, is going to be longer, but almost twice as long when you have a higher variability. So uh, deterministic, Q has a lower uh, number in the system and lower actually will also have a similarly lower value of the uh, time in the system. And uh, when CS squared is higher, you get a higher value of uh, time in the Q. So uh, basically the, the uh, MM1 is sort of between uh, deterministic, which has the no variability at all. And then MM1 has some variability because you have an exponential process. And then the most variability is when you have larger values of CS squared. So that's what these two questions are hopefully getting you to appreciate. Okay, any questions about this? Okay, so the last one is this, uh, again, sort of a plug and chuck kind of thing. Uh, Okay, so macro hard doors. So this is supposed to be a joke about Microsoft Windows, but anyway, <laughs> uh, you just go, okay, so you have the first thousand jobs. So if you have thousand jobs, we are getting, the, we find that the uh, sum of service times, so sum of service times uh, is equal to 412. And the sum of squared service times is, is uh, 1425. 
Okay. And then there are uh, jobs come in as a poisson, so you have a, a, a Markov arrival pro process. And then clearly this is a G, uh, we don't know the departure process, it's general. And we know, and it's one, and we know that the row is going to be 0.75. So what we want to know is the uh, mean number of jobs in the system. Basically we want to know expected value of N, right? So this looks pretty much like the previous value or previous thing over here, where we have expect N is given by rho plus rho square one plus CS square over to one minus rho. This is the, the PK formula, um, but we need to know what CS square is. So CS square, uh, so is given by, uh, CS square is given by expected value of S square over expected value of S, the whole square minus one. Uh, now we, we are given that the sum of service times is 412 and it's thousand jobs. So we're going to estimate. So we say this implies, okay, and now this is, uh, Statistically, we know we're just kind of uh, assuming that thousand jobs is long enough. And so expected value of S is given by 0.412. And similarly, the expected value of S square is given by uh, 1.425, because we just again saying that the, we're assuming that we're taking sort of what's called a frequentist approach to, uh, to the expectation. We're saying thousand jobs is long enough. So I know what these values are. And so uh, at 1,000 jobs, we expect that the uh, mean value is the, actually the expected value. Now, this is not necessarily true, right? If you think about, if you think about it, maybe at 1,000 jobs, you just had an unusual number of jobs coming in, and maybe later on it's different, and so the expected value is different, but we're going to make that assumption over here. So that's an assumption you can state. We assume that 1,000 jobs is enough for us to compute these expectations correctly. And if that's the case, then C square is going to be just, you just plug this in, it's going to be 7.39. And then if you plug this over here, uh, EN is uh, 0.75, which is rho plus 0.75 square into one plus 7.39 over uh, two times one minus 0.75. And this turns out to be, if my math is correct, 10.19. So basically expecting approximately 10 jobs in the system, uh, including the one in service uh, at any given point in time. So that's, that's really... Okay, any, any questions about this? Uh, I had a question about the notation. So yeah. in the notes, uh, it says that CS square, the CS square is the coefficient of variation. Yes. But isn't CS square the square of the coefficient of variation? Oh, I see. Uh, <laughs> interesting. Uh, do we call it the square of? Huh. I've always only heard the square is being called the coefficient, uh, but uh, I, I need to look into it. Is CS? We always, yeah, I, let, let me look into it. I'm sorry. Is it uh, because I think Wikipedia states that the coefficient of variation is uh, the standard deviation upon mean. Yeah. And if we square that, then we get like this formula. Yeah. Okay, I'm glad you looked into it then. So, yeah, so I guess I'm using it in case. This is the square of the coefficient of variation rather than the coefficient of variation itself. Uh, yeah, okay. Fair enough. I will make that correction uh, as Thank well. You. Yeah. Can I also ask yeah. a question? Of, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. So that's a question about um, decimal places given in uh, because we do have an approximate answer here. Right. And we're given sort of our inputs to three significant figures at times because the 412 is only three significant figures. So do we have yes. to fax that into the accuracy we're given off an answer? Oh, I see. Uh... I think, I, am, I, am, I, am I rounding off too soon? I mean, the fact of the matter is, again, you know, I take a fairly engineering approach to this. My approach is that, look, this 10.19 is approximately 10. I actually only care about the first, uh, you know, high order because all these numbers are approximate. I mean, even if you take 412.412, you could be off by, you know, a factor of 10 or 20. It could be 412, it could be 500, it could be 300. It's just a matter. In, in real life, in real life, when you're going to measure the first thousand jobs, 
it could be pretty much all over the place. So the approximation that you're going that, you know, 0.412 is accurate to three digits is, uh, is probably not accurate. I would probably only have like one digit of significance over there. So uh, if I wanted to be really proper about it, I would uh, round off everything to one digit of significance. But since I didn't state how significant it is, and you know, we, uh, if I were to go into the, all the details of it, you probably need to do multiple uh, runs of thousand jobs each and compute the uh, statistics properly. And we talk about simulation, we will do, go into this in much more detail. So I'm going to ignore it for now. But hold that thought, and when we talk about simulation, we'll talk more precisely about, is it enough to just look at 1,000 jobs? And the answer actually is no, right? We do need to look at multiple runs of 1,000 jobs, and then you need to look at uh, the settling down of the expectation of the, uh, not the expectation, but the settling down of the mean, and make sure that the uh, mean itself is sufficiently um, stable that we aren't uh, making a mistake. So I'm ignoring all of those uh, things now because I will return to those later. But, the, but that's a good point. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so, uh, all right. So let me move on then to the next one. So here we're gonna look at these uh, Questions from the back of this chapter uh, on for the uh, for the uh, uh, signals and so on. So uh, <laughs> I don't know how many uh, of you have seen this kind of phasers and complex arithmetic or the e to the j omega. So how many of you have seen this notation e to the j omega or e to the j theta before or i theta? One, two, okay, three. Okay, so three people have seen, oh, okay, a few of you, okay. <laughs> it's interesting, each one of you is using a different symbol. Okay, that's good. <laughs> uh, okay, anyway, um, I when I studied uh, complex analysis, uh, for that matter, complex numbers, I was in high school, I, I just found it really mysterious. You know, the whole thing was such a, my, my, my instructors were terrible. I had no idea. They, Kind of didn't want to talk about it and I didn't know what they're talking about and, and for quite a long time I really didn't understand uh, you know what is a complex number and then later on somebody said oh it's just the argon plane it's just a notation for a tuple it's x plus i y just forget about what i is it's just you know it's a tuple and if you have triple or quad, a quad then it becomes a tensor it's just a vector I mean, that's all and that's one way to think about it and uh, I think uh, that's a reasonable way to say, well, you know, complex number is just a vector and forget about it. But uh, I stumbled across this idea of I or J being a rotation operator. And I think that intuitively made a lot more sense to me. And so this little kind of two page is in the beginning of the chapter. Uh, I'm actually very proud of it because I, I, it took me forever to write it, but it, it does in fact, I think explain both the complex operator and uh, phasers in a way that uh, you know makes it very. I think it, I think it makes it easy to understand. At least it made it easy to understand for me. Um, and uh, when I was trying to explain it uh, to, to you know some people who had not seen this before, uh, they got it right away. So, for what it's worth, uh, I, I'm, I hope that it was something that you. Okay. Noah, you have a question or. Your hand is raised. Yeah, okay, so maybe not. All right, okay, so let's go on to the question. So the first one is uh, very simple. It just says compute e to the minus j pi by two uh, plus e to the j pi by two. And again, what you're gonna do is simply use Euler's formula over here. So we, I can, I'm just gonna do an excruciatingly, uh, excruciating detail. So the first one becomes cos uh, minus pi by two uh, plus j sine minus pi by two. And then the second one becomes plus cos pi by two plus j sine pi by two. And what we need to remember is that cos of uh, minus theta is equal to cos uh, theta and then sine of minus theta is equal to minus sine theta. So this is going to be true uh, for theta, for any value of theta. So this means that this one over here, j sine minus pi by two and j sine pi by two are, are just going to cancel each other out essentially. And so this becomes just two cos pi by two. 
and two cos pi by two, which is conveniently uh, zero. Right. Cos pi by two is zero. Okay, so any questions about that? Okay, that is simple. Uh, the second one is again a pretty straightforward one. Uh, at, uh, basically, we're looking at one plus j, what's the face angle? And it's probably easiest to just draw it like this in the argon plane. This is that's j and that's one. And so one plus j is over here. And we look at this vector over here going from zero to one plus j. It's obvious that this theta is going to be pi by four. And you can also get this as tan inverse of one over one. Uh, which is going to be pi by four. It's tan inverse of one is pi by four. Uh, so there's two different ways to do it graphically or or, or in this way, but either way you should be getting that. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay, so the third thing is about discrete convolution. So um, Typically, uh, when convolution is presented, it's usually presented with uh, starting with the continuous convolution and then uh, discrete is often not mentioned because most often people studying uh, uh, signals and systems are electrical engineers. And for them, the continuous uh, time is far more intuitive uh, than the discrete time. And I think I mentioned to one of you in, in my office last week, discrete time actually from a mathematical perspective is very problematic uh, because anything that's discrete has it doesn't have derivatives really right if you think about it if its value is defined only at certain points in time well what is the value between those points in time well it's not defined and if it's not defined then the limits don't exist and so all of the all of the mechanism of a calculus goes away you know you can't do limits because you, you don't exist you can't do derivatives, you can't do integrals, you can't do any of these things. You know, derivatives becomes you know, differences, integrals become sums. But all of the you know, very beautiful mathematics you can do for you know, real analysis goes away, but it's not real, these are integers, right? And so uh, from the perspective of electrical engineer, uh, discrete time is a nightmare because things don't quite match you know, all the training you get in continuous time analysis. But from a computer science perspective, in discrete is what we do, right? We, we talk about discrete all the time. I mean, our world is a discrete world because computer clocks are discrete. And so each clock step is a discrete evolution of state. And so state becomes. So, the, uh, uh, so that's why, you know, most books don't talk about discrete uh, convolution at all continuous first. But from our perspective, sort of computer science perspective, discrete convolution is way easier to understand. Uh, because we just have to talk about these sums. So, okay, so what is the sum? We want to look at these, uh, the, so the, let me write it down over here. So we have X of T and X of T is given sort of the, this time series. So, uh, and I'm going to write it on in a particular way. So this is, uh, uh, this is the value of time. So uh, zero, one, two, Uh, and then the values are one, three, five, two, five, eight, seven, three, nine, four. Okay, and uh, let me just write as a table. It'll be easier, and you see where the, you just bear with me. That's this is x of t over here. So this x. And then a y is given by the same thing with three, uh, one, seven, four, five, nine, seven, one, three, eight. Okay, and we need to, we want to compute z of five. Okay. And so if you look at the formula for z of five, uh, z of five is given by uh, sigma minus, so tau equals minus, infinity to infinity, x star, uh, y, phi minus star. And if you, if you look at it carefully, what you see is that um, this value, x star plus y, phi minus star, these two things sum up to five. Basically, star plus phi minus star equals five, right? So that's, that, that gives us a hint as how to 
how to compute Z of five. We want to look at all values of tau such that this X value index and the Y value index sum up to five, okay? And, and so uh, what it means is you're going to match up, you're going to match up X zero to X zero, which is over here to uh, Y uh, Y five, because that sums up to five, uh, okay? And then you're going to match up X one. Uh, so maybe I'll draw a line like that, X zero to Y five, X one, to y4 like that, then x2 to y3, x3 to y2, x4 to y1, and x5 to y0. So that's the set of pairs you want to look at. And if you look at it this way, then you'll see that this is going to be equal to uh, you know, so 1, 9, 1 times 9 plus 3 times 5. I'm just using comma for multiplier plus five four uh, plus two seven plus oops, plus five one plus eight three and this turns out to be eighty seven. Okay, and so the the critical thing is to remember that the sum of the indices adds up to the uh, value over here, which is what we want to compute. And once you do that, then it's pretty straightforward. Okay, and then the similar thing uh, extends to continuous time and uh, the continuous time case is far more complex as the, as the example shows, you know, actually I, I set that example for myself. It took me a long time to solve it, but it's really not obvious at all how to do it properly. And uh, uh, so I did solve it, you know, as I said, it took me a while, but I solved it completely and put it in the book mainly because I, just really, I wanted to demonstrate how complex it is. And then the beauty of uh, transforms is that that complexity just goes away. We get rid of it completely by using transforms. So it's, at least you should appreciate the complexity. Okay, any questions about this? Okay, and then the last one was about the uh, example of a signal that's continuous, digital, aperiodic, and time unlimited. Of course, you can cover all sorts of things. So does anybody want to answer that? Anyone? Um, can, yeah. Can we have something like, um... X of t is uh, one if t is a uh, perfect square and zero otherwise. Let me see. So X of t is one if t is a perfect space. Okay. So X of t equals one if t is a uh, square. Perfect okay. Square. Yeah, that's fine. Perfect square or else zero. So, okay. So let's go to that. It's, so it's a, is it uh, uh, continuous? Uh, uh, should be digit, uh, should be uh, yeah, T is, so T is continuous. continuous. Yeah, so it is continuous because. No, it's uh, it's not continuous. It's, um, I thought it about uh, the discrete case, to be honest. Okay, yeah, so it's not, okay. So you're looking at integer T, I assume. You could have T belongs to R. I mean, you could have this, you know, it's a continuous function that's only at zero except for those point values. So it okay. could be continuous, but yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. But I think intuitively you're talking about a discrete, uh, 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 the digital, sorry, discrete case. So I don't think it matters. It matters. Anyone yeah, this is only for the discrete case. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? I tried to come up with a uh, real world example. Yeah. So go I ahead. have, I have the number of cars um, on a given roundabout. Uh, in the UK road network somewhere. Um, so it's continuous because clearly cars join and leave a roundabout at yeah. clean boundaries. Uh, digital in that there's only so many cars you could fit on the roundabout. So there is a finite yeah. capacity. Yeah. Um, and you measure the discrete number of cars. Yeah. Um, a periodic, just because yes, sure. you'll see some vague daily cycle, but that's not the mm -hmm. same thing as periodicity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, time unlimited because it doesn't tend to cease to exist. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's perfect. I mean, so your signal does look something like this. We have this uh, sort of number of cars is going to follow this sort of square wave type of thing. 
depending on the number of two cars came in right there. So, right, so that would be a continuous aperiodic uh, signal over here. Uh, anybody else have a, another similar example? That's, that's a that's very good example. Uh, the one I came up with was readings from a digital thermometer. Where, you know, the readings are taken at different points in time. So, uh, uh, you know, so the, the, I mean, I, I should note that these values are not even the space. This is whenever the car enters or leaves, you have a, you have a transition from one state to another state. And that's exactly where it's continuous. Same thing with the digital thermometer, you maybe read it at different points in time. Whenever you look at it, you know the value and it's going to have a discrete value. Uh, quantized value because it's digital thermometer and it's continuous and API. Okay, uh, any other questions about anything else? Because you've gone through the examples of so far, so I don't have any more. Yeah, sorry, could you go up to the first queuing theory question? I just wanted to double check something in my answer. Yeah, sure, sure, yeah. So the first queuing theory question was, uh, was it this one over here? The MM1 versus MD1? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, what did, what was the... So you take in, are you taking the ratio here between... Uh... The expected number in the queue, expected number over here versus the expected number with the, M, uh, with the MM1 queue, which is row over one minus row. So I'm taking the ratio of this quantity over here or divided by rho over one minus rho. And so this cancels out as one minus rho over two. Okay, yeah, that sounds good, thanks. Sure. Any other questions? Okay, good, so we're done with that. Uh, do you have any feedback about the class? Uh, generally speaking, you know, uh, uh, as I mentioned to you in the first lecture, this is the first time I've been teaching with uh, you know notes with videos things. So I'm going to first stop the recording because I don't think that's something you want recorded necessarily. But uh, give me a second. Uh, let me see.